Good evening. Uh, it's a real privilege and an honor to be with you guys tonight um, here at the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center. And thanks to Tom, thanks to Jeff, thanks to Carl and Mary and everybody else who arranged for me to be here because it is, it's truly a privilege and it's an honor. And it's um, even more so to be able to be here tonight as the, as the Kleber speaker this evening after hearing his wonderful uh, story of, of survival, of uh, of being captured at D-Day. And if you haven't had a chance over in the reading room, they have his books on display. I made a, an effort earlier today when I was in there to go over and read and look at those. And it's really just, a, it, it brings that story really home to you to see those books. So I would encourage you if you, if you have a chance to stop by there on some time. Um, the Doolittle Raid. A lot of people here, I imagine if you were to raise your hands, a lot of people here have heard of the Doolittle Raid. Am I correct? Let's see. All right. So, uh, well, the Doolittle Raid was America's answer to Pearl Harbor. It was a surprise attack on Tokyo executed just four months after the Japanese assault on Hawaii. It was a virtual suicide mission. 16 bombers crewed by 80 volunteer airmen flew a one-way mission to pummel Japan's factories, its warehouses, and its shipyards, and then escaped to free China. But it was much more than just a bombing raid. The attack was a powerful tonic needed to rally a shell-shocked nation to assure the U.S. public in its darkest hour that in the end we would win, that America would prevail. And the effect the raid had on this country seven decades ago was profound. That's what Tom was just touching on a minute ago. Americans were so moved by the heroism of these airmen that a war bond poster signed by Mission Commander Jimmy Doolittle fetched a staggering $4 million in 1942. That's the equivalent of $58 million today for a signed war bond poster. A town in Missouri went so far as to change its name to Doolittle in his honor. And of course, the raid had even greater effects on the outcome of the war. The raid prompted the Japanese in the summer of 1942 to make an ill-fated grab for Midway, which turned out to be a disastrous naval battle for them and cost them four aircraft carriers. It shifted the balance of power in favor of the U.S. and the Pacific. But it was the Chinese who paid the largest price. Outraged, over the raid, Japan launched a retaliatory campaign in the summer of 1942 that killed an estimated 250,000 men, women, and children and prompted comparisons to the rape of Nanking. All of these things occurred because of one raid, because of 16 bombers crewed by 80 volunteer airmen. And that is what makes the Doolittle Raid one of the most incredible stories of World War II. Now, the Doolittle Raid really began on the morning America entered World War II. In the pre-dawn hours of that Sunday, December 7, 1941, six Japanese aircraft carriers, the largest carrier task force at the time that it ever put to sea, cut through the dark swells some 230 miles north of Oahu. Throughout the carriers, airmen rose early that morning and dressed in clean loincloths and pressed uniforms, pausing alongside portable Shinto shrines to sip sake and pray for victory before heading topside to their planes. The faint light of dawn punctured the morning clouds as the carrier swung into the wind and increased speed to prepare to launch. 183 fighters, bombers, and torpedo planes roared off the carrier's decks in the first wave, followed by a second strike of 167 planes. The attack on Pearl Harbor was more than just a raid, but the dramatic opening act of war against the United States. A surgical strike designed to mortally wound America's powerful Pacific fleet anchored in the cool waters of Hawaii. Japanese Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, the architect of the attack, knew it was imperative for Japan to sideline the United States before the war even began. Quote, the fate of our empire, he warned in one of his final dispatches, depends upon this operation. That Sunday morning, American forces slumbered. Troops had been out the night before cruising down Honolulu's famous hotel street, lined with tattoo parlors, uh, pinball joints, and shooting galleries. Others had watched Clark Gable as the frontier con man in the, in the movie Honky Tonk, or attended the finals and the battles of the band at the New Block Recreation Center. When Japanese planes appeared in the skies over Pearl Harbor this Sunday morning, America was caught completely off guard. This is actually a Japanese photograph of the early uh, opening um, part of the attack, and you can actually see the spray coming up from, the, uh, from there off of Ford Island. Pearl Harbor resembled a parking lot that morning with 94 ships in port, almost half of the entire Pacific fleet. Pilots immediately zeroed in on the nine battleships moored side by side. This is another captured Japanese photograph that shows the uh, uh, battleships Oklahoma in the top right and the West Virginia below it. And you can see the oil spilling out from the two uh, where they've been hit by torpedoes. 
Japanese strategists had perfected the plan of the attack down to the use of wooden torpedo fins in order to run in the shallow waters of Pearl Harbor. Here, a boat attempts to rescue sailors from the battleship West Virginia, which was hit by at least nine torpedoes that morning. The smoke from the uh, burning warships literally darkened the horizon and could be seen for miles. In addition to targeting the Navy's warships, the Japanese zeroed in on Hawaii's airfields, including the Naval Air Station at Pearl Harbor, ultimately destroying almost 200 planes. The attack on Pearl Harbor destroyed or damaged 18 warships, including eight battleships. Pictured here is the capsized battleship, Oklahoma. And of course, the human toll proved horrific. Casualties among soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines soared to more than 3,500, a figure that included 2,403 that were killed that Sunday. Now in Washington, President Roosevelt was in the White House finishing up his lunch when news of the attack reached Washington. After that afternoon, as damage reports continued to pour in, he wrote what was arguably his most famous speech, even though it totaled less than 500 words. His use of the word infamy, his son later noted, would forever describe what happened that day. The next afternoon at 12.30 p.m., he delivered that speech before Congress, asking for a declaration of war. Now, personally, Roosevelt was sickened by the attack, and he knew that the immediate patriotism that flared up in the wake of the, uh, of the attack on Pearl Harbor would prove short-lived. But he also knew that America was in no position to go on a sustained offensive. It would take much of 1942, in fact, to enlist and train the troops, to build the bombers, the battleships, the bullets, and the rifles. Yet he knew that the American public's patience wouldn't last that long. So before rescuers could even pull all the bodies out of the oily waters of Pearl Harbor, he summoned his senior military leaders, and he demanded America find a way to strike back. Not an attack against some far-flung island in the Japanese Empire, but an attack directly on Tokyo. Now, the challenge facing American war planners at that time was how to do it. America had no bases in the region from which to operate. In addition to the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Japanese had seized Guam and Wake from the United States. The Philippines was under siege and would soon fall. The Japanese had likewise taken Hong Kong and Singapore from the British and the Dutch East Indies, which today we now know as Indonesia, from the Netherlands. In a few short months, Japan had built an empire that stretched across more than 20 million square miles in seven time zones. To put it in another way, Literally one-tenth of the world was under the control of Emperor Hirohito. Not only did the United States not have any bases in the region from which to operate, but the three aircraft carriers we had at Pearl Harbor that had been fortunate enough to escape destruction that Sunday morning, it was, it was deemed simply too risky for us to be able to use those carriers in the strike on Tokyo. The launch and recovery distances would require them literally to steam so close to the Japanese waters. It was a risk we simply couldn't take. But none of this mattered to FDR who in each of his meetings continued to press Admiral Ernest King and Air Force Commander General Hap Arnold to find a way to strike back. And while in Norfolk in early January of 1942, one of Admiral King's staffers, he was there checking up on the, uh, on the Hornet, uh, happened to notice a bunch of Navy planes taking off and landing on, a, a, uh, on a, a runway marked up to look like a flight deck. And he had a thought. He said, what if we swapped out these short-range Navy planes and substituted them for longer range army bombers. And that idea, that thought that popped into his head that, that January day in 1942 became the gen genesis of what today we now know as the Doolittle Raid. Now, taking that idea and turning it into a reality fell to 45-year-old Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle, who was without a doubt one of the most fascinating characters of the 20th century. Doolittle was born in California, but he was raised in Alaska, where his father was an unsuccessful gold prospector. Doolittle was small in stature. He stood just five feet, four inches tall. Yet on all of his military records, he upped his height by two inches. <laughs> now, the, the Alaska that he grew up with around the turn of the century was a pretty rough and tumble environment. In fact, there were more saloons than there were grocery stores, and it was, a, uh, it was, a pretty wild, it was like the Wild West, if you will. And Doolittle realized that if he was going to survive in Nome, he'd have to learn how to fight. And, uh, and so what he lacked in size, he made up for in spirit. And to avoid bullying, he became a fighter. And in fact, he proved so good at it that he eventually became a professional boxer. Now, he returned to California as a young man and enrolled in college. And he'd always harbored an interest in flying. And so he enlisted in the Army when World War I began. And on his first flight, he fell in love with it. And he proved so good at flying that rather than send him to Europe, the Army kept him home to train others. 
Quote, my students were going overseas and becoming heroes, he later lamented. My job was to stay home and make more heroes. When the war ended, Doolittle chose to remain in the service. The reason being it was the one place he could still fly every day and earn a paycheck. And, uh, and this was the early era of aviation. Pilots were constantly testing themselves. They were testing their aircraft and whatnot. And so Doolittle, you know, as, as a boxer and a fighter, immediately jumped into the fray. He set a number of speed records, and uh, he was also the first pilot to ever fly cross-country in less than a day. It took him 22 hours to do so. Of course, this is the era before GPS. So when Doolittle did his flight, he, he literally took Rand McNally road maps with him and just kind of navigated his way across the country that way. Um, but he was also brilliant. Doolittle went on to earn his master's and his doctorate at MIT. And he recognized that one of the biggest challenges facing early aviators was the inability to fly if you couldn't see where you were going. So he helped develop the artificial horizon, which is still standard on airplanes today. He's also the first pilot to ever take off, fly over set course, and land again using only instrumentation. And he did it while zipped inside a hooded cockpit. And they actually had to have another pilot and a set of controls in front of him who had to have his hands above his head like this, so that observers on the ground would see that Doolittle was actually operating the aircraft. The New York Times summed it up best when they said in 1927, Doolittle is as gifted with brains as he is with courage. Now, all of these attributes made it this the perfect job for Doolittle to be the one to have to plan this raid on Tokyo. And it's one of the first jobs that landed on his desk in the beginning of World War II as he was the staff troubleshooter for Hap Arnold, who was the commander of the Army Air Forces. And one of, his, um, one of the first things he looked at in planning this was the logistics. Uh, and he determined that the B-25 was the best airplane for such a mission. And the reason he picked the B-25 was that it had uh, about a seven-foot clearance from the wingtip to the island superstructure on an aircraft carrier. So it could just barely slide by and take off. But he also realized that that, that meant it would never be able to land again on board. So this would have to be a one-way mission. Pilots would have to literally be able to take off, fly to Japan, bomb Japan, and then make it all the way to free China, sort of inland China, away from the parts occupied by the Japanese. Uh, and so he set a range of about 2,400 miles that his pilots would have to fly. Now, the B-25 had a typical range at that time of about 1,300 miles. So he's almost going to have to double how far these planes could do. So he and his men ultimately devised several different rubber bladders that were extra fuel tanks that could be sort of shoehorned in extra spaces inside the B-25. Uh, the planes would also have to be stripped down of all unnecessary equipment, including radios, even the lower gun turret. To scare off Japanese fighters, they actually came up with this ruse in which they put two black boards, essentially painted black, looked like basically broomsticks, if you will, out the tail of the B-25. So at least if they didn't have a gun, it looked like they had a gun. Doolittle then had to pick his airmen. The B-25 was a workhorse of World War II. We'd ultimately build about 10,000 of them, but this was a pretty early, but at this point in the war, it was a pretty new airplane, pretty early. Uh, and we only had several squadrons that were flying them mostly off of Oregon where they were flying anti-submarine patrols. So Doolittle ordered those pilots and the squadrons transferred to Columbia, South Carolina, and there he recruited what would ultimately be the 79 volunteer airmen that would fly this mission. Those pilots then transferred to the Florida Panhandle, which was out in the boonies, as one of them said at that time, away from prying eyes, where they trained um, under the direction of a Navy pilot in the art of carrier takeoffs. Meanwhile, as Doolittle in the, is working on the logistics of this and his pilots are being trained, the Navy is assembling its, its end of the job. It's, it's putting together its task force of 16 ships, about 10,000 sailors under the command of colorful Admiral William Bull Halsey. And the risks that the Navy was willing to take for this operation were extraordinary. And I can't understate that enough. The, uh, we had three aircraft carriers at the time of the attack on Pearl Harbor. The Hornet was just being, uh, finishing up at, um, its trials, and so it would join the Pacific Fleet. And then we would transfer the Wasp from the Atlantic Fleet over to the Pacific Fleet. So by the time of the raid, we had five aircraft carriers in the Pacific. That was still half of the 10 that Japan counted. Now, the B-25s were so big that they couldn't fit in an aircraft um, elevator, uh, carrier elevator, so they'd have to be um, tied down on deck, but also meant that if they ran into any opposition from the Japanese, there was no way to swap them out for fighters that might be able to protect the carrier. So we'd have to send a second aircraft carrier, the Enterprise, along for cover. So two of those five aircraft carriers uh, would have to literally steam in radio silence 5,200 miles all the way across the Pacific uh, to the enemy's backyard, hoping that nowhere along the way would they run into any merchant ships, any submarines, 
any Japanese naval warships, things like that. So the, the risk the Navy was taking truly were extraordinary here. April 2nd, 1942, just 16 weeks after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Hornet departed San Francisco bound for Tokyo. The carrier's only protection uh, were four cruisers and eight destroyers. And tied down on deck of the Hornet with the wheels chalk stood those 16 B-25 bombers. And here's a close-up shot of one of those. The bombers had so little room on deck that the tail of the 16th plane literally dangled over the aircraft carrier's fan tail. And the task force steamed across the northern Pacific, taking a route uh, that guaranteed cold, rough weather, but it also decreased the likelihood that they would run into any other uh, ships out there. The weather, however, was so rough that refueling ships at sea proved very problematic and difficult. Several sailors were washed overboard and had to be recovered. This is actually a, uh, one of the refuelings uh, here in this photograph. Now, as the task force neared Japan on April 17, 1942, Doolittle and his men held a brief ceremony on board the deck of the Hornet, wiring Japanese medals that had been given to American sailors during a 1908 visit to Yokoyama, Yokohama to the uh, bombs that would soon fall on Tokyo. Here's a close-up shot of one of those. Other sailors took the opportunity to scrawl messages on the bombs, like the one penciled on the, uh, the tail of this bomb here. Uh, quote, I don't want to set the world on fire, just Tokyo. Uh, others read, bombs made in America, laid in Japan. A number of sailors even you know, dedicated them to their parents and to girlfriends and whatnot. So. Afterward, the airmen loaded ammunition in preparation for the raid. Now, an important player in the Doolittle story is Japanese Admiral Yamamoto, who was the architect of the attack on Pearl Harbor, as I noted earlier. Now, Yamamoto is, is one of the most interesting characters in the Japanese military at this time. He's the son of a samurai warrior, but he'd also lived in the United States and studied at Harvard. And he understood America's great national resolve. And he was one of the few voices in the Japanese military establishment that had said it was a really bad idea to go to war with the United States. Um, now, the Japanese public at this time, of course, is celebrating all their many victories, the attack on Pearl Harbor, the capture of Singapore, and whatnot. But it was a celebration that, that Yamamoto really disdained. And he feared that America's aircraft carriers, which were missing that Sunday morning in Pearl Harbor, were going to come back and haunt Japan. And it was a fear that grew into an obsession for him, so much so that he demanded daily weather reports over Tokyo. And only on days when it was cloudy or raining would his aides say that he he seemed to relax a little bit. He went so far as to advise a geisha friend of his to move all of her property outside of the city. Now, the Japanese were not early adopters of radar, but Yamamoto's fears led him instead to create a system of picket boats that were fishing trawlers, things like that, that could be positioned anywhere from a few hundred miles to about a thousand miles off the coast of Japan. And the idea being that any inbound American task force would run into these boats and, uh, and would be able to sound the alarm that the Americans were coming. Uh, but more than that, however, Yamamoto realized that he needed to find a way to sink America's carriers that they'd failed to do at Pearl Harbor. And uh, the United States, um, during this time from the, from the attack on Pearl Harbor until the Doolittle Raid, used its carriers and treated them much like an endangered species, if you will. I mean, we just, we really were protective of them. We would send them out for a raid off New Guinea, for instance, and then before the Japanese could counterattack, they would vanish. We'd pull them back and vanish. And Yamamoto knew that it was really only a matter of time before those carriers didn't show up off some far-flung island, but directly off of Tokyo. And he had to find a reason to lure those aircraft carriers back out where his forces could finish the job that they had failed to do at Pearl Harbor. And he wanted to go back, actually, and attack Hawaii again, but the Army would never greenlight it. So he set his sights instead on Midway, which is a small coral windswept atoll about 1,200 miles from Oahu. Uh, and at the time, it was home to an American submarine base and airstrip. And he knew that this was a, literally a piece of priceless Pacific real estate that America would have no choice but to defend. So he began to advocate that Japan take Midway. And to his surprise, he got pushed back not only from the Army, but also from others inside the Navy. This debate was going on literally at the exact same time that Doolittle and the Hornet are at sea. Little did Yamamoto know at this time, however, that Jimmy Doolittle was about to help him make his final sales pitch. Meanwhile, each hour, each mile, the American warships are getting closer and closer to Japan. And throughout the task force, the earlier excitement of the mission was now replaced by soaring tensions. 
His radio men hunkered over the receivers 24 hours a day, monitoring Japanese communications. No one stewed more than Jimmy Doolittle. The Hornets chaplain saw him one night, literally pacing from rail to rail, the weight of this entire mission on this one man's shoulders. Now, early in the morning of April 18th, the task, force, task force's radars began to light up with blips. These were the picket boats that Yamamoto had positioned off the coast of Japan. At this point, however, the task force was about 1,000 miles still away from Japan. So rather than um, engage, Halsey decides that they're going to essentially try to thread their way between these different picket boats throughout the night using the cover of darkness. At this point, literally every mile, every hour mattered. Finally, at daybreak, however, the carriers were spotted by Japanese picket boats. The task force could run no longer. The time to fight had arrived. American pilots and gunners sprang into action and destroyed several of these picket boats, uh, ultimately capturing a number of Japanese prisoners of war. But they didn't destroy them before the Japanese were able to send a message that the American carriers were coming. So the secret they had fought so hard to protect was now gone. The Japanese had been alerted that they were coming. Meanwhile, back on board the carrier Hornet, Doolittle faced an incredible decision. What does he do at this point? Do they, do they, the Japanese know they're coming? They're, uh, they're still more than 800 miles away from Tokyo. When Doolittle had planned this operation, he'd set 400 miles as the optimal distance to take off. At 400 miles, he'd have enough fuel to be able to take off, reach Japan, bomb his objectives, and still make it to free China. He'd set 650 miles as the outside maximum from which he could still do that and make it to land. There were no American destroyers. There were no submarines. There was no one waiting in the East China Sea to rescue him and his men if they didn't make it. But at this morning, after they've been discovered, after Japan's been alerted that they're coming, they're still more than 800 miles away. So what does Jimmy Doolittle do? Well, the weather this morning was atrocious. Heavy seas were crashing against the bow of the Hornet, sending spray over the carrier's uh, deck onto the flight deck. Doolittle climbed into the cockpit of the first bomber. Just 467 feet separated him from the cold Pacific waves. He flashed the thumbs up sign to the uh, Hornet signal officer. Clutching a uh, checkered flag, began waving in circles, signaling Doolittle to push the throttles all the way forward. Everything all ready? Doolittle asked his crew chief, Everything's okay, Colonel, came the response. The signal officer dropped the flag and Doolittle released the brakes. The bomber roared down the flight deck at 8.20 a.m. Doolittle passed 50 feet, then 100, then 200. He's never going to make it, someone on deck shouted. The bomber charged toward the end of the flight deck and then appeared to vanish. Doolittle's gone, one of the Army navigators thought to himself. We're going to have to make it without him. But then the bomber roared up into the gray skies over the carrier's bow, and sailors crowded along the flight deck, and the carrier's island erupted in cheers. Quote, the shout that went up should have been heard in Tokyo, the mission's doctor remembered. The other 15 bombers took off one right after the other at less than four-minute intervals, flying just above the wave tops inbound toward Japan. The 16 bombers crossed over the the beaches and into the Japanese mainland, aimed at Tokyo and other key industrial cities like Kobe and Osaka. Each plane carried just four bombs. They flew over baseball games. They flew over schools. Children waved at them. A few even threw rocks at one of the bombers as it came in over one of the beaches. As the crews came in over Tokyo, they could actually see the muddy moat that encircled Emperor Hirohito's palace. This is one of only two photographs shot from the cockpits of the, of the bombers that survived the raid. And you're looking down at the Yokosuka Naval Station, shot from the, uh, the navigator of the 13th plane. Here's another shot of that same Navy base. Now, there have been some books done in the past on the Doolittle Raid, but until this one, no one's ever gone in to look in, uh, in Japanese archives for what kind of records survived from the raid, documenting the story from their perspective. Uh, and what's amazing is actually the after-action report of the Doolittle Raid survived. And it's amazing for a couple reasons. One being that Tokyo was firebombed at the end of the war and a lot was destroyed. And number two, the Japanese, before the war ended, destroyed a lot of their own documents to prevent them from falling into um, U.S. hands. But the after-action report for the Doolittle Raid actually survived. 
And on that report were 40 photographs, all about sizes three by three, about that big, that were literally glued down onto that report that showed the damage that was done. Now, whatever happened to the negatives, we don't know, but we were able to actually scan those images in and clean them up and we were able to reproduce them. And what you're actually looking at here is a, uh, is a destroyed uh, home, actually, in Tokyo. And you can see that you know, so much of the architecture of Japan at that time, literally about 98% of Tokyo was made out of wood and paper. This is another photograph, actually, of a uh, destroyed factory building that Harold Watson's plane hit. And here's a crater uh, left by one of the 500-pound demolition bombs. All told, the raid killed uh, 87 people, and um, about 500 others were injured, and about 151 of those seriously. The raiders obliterated 112 buildings and damaged another 53. Here's another bomb crater near the Asahi Electrical Manufacturing Corporation in Tokyo. It measured more than 15 feet wide and 10 feet deep. Uh, and these Japanese officials give you sort of a sense of the size of one of these craters. It wow. kind of put, helps put it in perspective of uh, one of the blasts in Tokyo. It's similar here, this individual standing literally in the center of one bomb crater. You can see the debris around him of the remains of, one of, of a factory building, and you can see the blown out panels and, and glass of the, uh, of the adjacent factory there as well. This was a home in Tokyo that was hit, where one person was killed. And here's another shot of that same place where they're uh, cleaning up the uh, debris and all afterwards. Now the Japanese were very meticulous in tracking down uh, number, uh, tracking down what uh, the raid, in, including all the duds. I mean, there were a number of duds, particularly with the incendiary. So they, they wanted to know what kind of ordinance the United States used. And so in this photograph, you're actually inside of a building looking out, and you can see the sort of the hole, if you will, where they're excavating down into the pluff mud. And there you can see a couple workers digging even deeper, trying to get to the bottom. And then about 15 feet down in the mud, they found it. Now, this is a photograph from the Yamiuri newspaper um, after the attack showing one of the bombers. You can see they were literally coming in just above the rooftops. You can see the clouds, the anti-aircraft fire around them. And the headlines of the paper are great because, of course, the Japanese military and government controlled the, the media, and so uh, it's all propaganda. Headline here says, quote, as pledged, a glorious defense of the homeland, which uh, is, is humorous because all the bombers made it through Japan without any problem. Only two of them were actually hit by any anti-aircraft fire. So, uh, uh, all 16 made it out of Japan, low on fuel. Uh, one, plant, one crew diverted to Russia, where authorities interned them for 13 months. The rest pressed on for mainland China. Fuel lights popped on. The men were convinced they were going to run out of water, go down in the East China Sea, until a big tailwind came out and blew them those last few miles across. One of the raiders later described it as the hand of heaven pushing them there. As they closed in on the Chinese coast, they could look down, they could see that the water color changed from blue to brown, indicating the sediment coming in from the rivers. And they knew they were getting close. Safety was at hand. They, you know, they, they began to think that they were going to survive and live. And then the weather fell out on them. It started raining and whatnot. And here they were coming in over the coast of China. And they were aiming at gravel runways tucked between mountains that climbed up about 10,000 feet. And the raiders realized that they, most of them had no option but to either bail out or try to sort of crash land along the Chinese coast. Three raiders were killed during this time. Eight were ultimately captured by the Japanese, and the rest, all, their help came at the hands of locals and missionaries. This is a photograph of Jimmy Doolittle sitting alongside the wing of his bomber the day after the raid. He was convinced, he's sulking at this point, he's convinced that the raid had been an absolute failure. Uh, he had had to bail out at night. Um, he didn't know where the rest of his crew were. He only knew where a, a couple of them were at this point. He had no idea what had happened to the rest of the bombers. Um, and so at this point, he was just convinced it was an absolute failure. Well, his, his crew chief, Paul Leonard, comes up to him at this time and says, you know, i gotta, I got to cheer the old man up. And so he tells him, he says, you know, it's not as bad as you think it is, really. It's not. In fact, I predict, actually, that they are going to, they're going to give you the Medal of Honor for this. And Doolittle says, no, Paul, look, I appreciate it. I know what you're trying to do, but in all reality, um, it's a failure. They're going to court-martial me. 
So Paul Leonard says, all right, well, I've, I've got to sort of up my game a little bit here. So he says, no, no, not only are they going to give you the Medal of Honor, they're going to make you a general. And at that point, Doolittle's a lieutenant colonel. So if he's going to be a general, he's going to have to skip a rank. So Doolittle again says, you know, Paul, I appreciate it, but thank you, but no, it's, it's really a failure. Now, remember that, because we're going to come back to that story in, in just a bit. So um, here's another photograph, actually, of Doolittle and his wreck B-25. About a year or two ago, a Chinese historian actually uh, excavated part of the wreckage of Doolittle's plane. Uh, it's, eight of the planes have been found in China. And a lot of them were literally stripped of everything, but just bits and pieces of metal. But uh, I've got a small sliver of Doolittle's plane that I got uh, at the Doolittle Raider reunion earlier this year. Now, the air crews were scattered across several hundred miles, and they had to find their way overland uh, to Chongqing. This is actually a photograph of Doolittle reunited with his crew. And if you look to the left of Doolittle, is Dick Cole, who was his co-pilot. And Dick is the last surviving Raider. He's 101. He'll be 102 in September. Uh, in fact, he was at Oshkosh uh, just this past week, a uh, week and a half ago uh, up there. And, uh, an incredible guy. Now, a few of the Raiders were injured. If anybody's read 30 Seconds Over Tokyo, you know the story of Ted Lawson. Uh, he was, of course, the one who was injured the most. Here he is here. Um, he ultimately had to have his left leg amputated by the mission's doctor in a rural Chinese hospital. That hospital, not only is it still there, but the operating room where they amputated his leg has been preserved. And, then, uh, and, and so, yeah, in fact, in, in fact, one of the raiders from the ruptured duck's son went back there this past year to go and retrace his dad's steps. And uh, the other raiders had to make their way overland across rural China using any form of transportation available, sedan chairs, rickshaws. One crew ultimately rode miniature ponies. Uh, everywhere the raiders went, they were celebrated as heroes. And that status was made official when they reached Chongqing, which was China's wartime capital. There, Madam Chiang Kai-shek awarded them Chinese commendation medals. And here's a picture of Doolittle with um, his second in command, Jack Hilger, and his co-pilot. Get Cole there on the end. Now, all the raiders just fell in love with Madame Chiang Kai-shek. You know, she's the wife of the Chinese nationalist ruler, and she'd actually lived in the United States, and so she spoke fluent English, and she'd gone to school in the South, so she spoke it with a Southern accent. And so they called it her Scarlet O'Hara accent. And she wore these really elegant outfits and everything. So all the raiders had crushes on it. They were all lining up to give her their hats and things like that. And so she, of course, had her picture made with lots of them. And so she was getting her picture taken with some of the Raiders, and uh, she was standing in front of him, and one of the guys looks at his buddy next to him. He says, hey, I can never show this to my girlfriend. And Madam Chang turns around looks at him, and she goes, she blonde or brunette? <laughs> so, um, but the biggest award awaited uh, waited Doolittle when he got back to Washington, where President Roosevelt awarded him the Medal of Honor, and he was promoted to the rank of Brigadier General. So it just goes to show you, your crew chief is always right. Now, for eight of the Raiders captured by the Japanese, the story was far from over. The Raiders suffered horrific torture, beatings, and waterboardings at the hand of the Japanese. The Raiders were ultimately put on trial and convicted in a sham proceeding that lasted less than 30 minutes. The Japanese sentenced them to death, but ultimately commuted the sentences of five of them to life in prison. Three of the Raiders, however, would face the firing squad, including Billy Farrow, who's a native of South Carolina, where I live. Now, on the eve of their execution, the Japanese allowed the three condemned men to write letters, last letters home to their families. And what's amazing is that those letters survived, not because the Japanese did anything with them. In fact, they just stuck them in a drawer. They were literally found in 1946 after the war in a um, Shanghai funeral parlor and desk there. And they were eventually given back to the family, but the Japanese never sent them back. The families did receive them after the war. So we know that on the eve of his execution, Billy Farrow wrote four letters. He wrote letters to his mother, his aunt, his best friend, and his girlfriend, Elizabeth Sims, whom he'd met when he was a student at the University of South Carolina. And he showed an incredible sense of maturity for a 24-year-old man on the night before he's to be executed. He wrote to her that night, quote, You are to me the only girl that would have meant the condition of my life. I've realized the kind of life being married to you would have meant to me and to both of us, and I know that we would have found complete happiness. It is a pity we were born in this day and age. At least we had part of that happiness. Find yourself the good man you deserve because you have so much to give the right one. The Japanese came for Billy Farrow, Dean Hallmark, and Harold Spatz on the afternoon of October 15, 1942. 
taking them out to public cemetery number one on the outskirts of Shanghai. The raiders were made to kneel and uh, were bound to three white crosses like the ones you see here. The Japanese placed a white cloth around each man's head with a black dot drawn to mark the center of the forehead. A single shot killed each of those three raiders. The other raiders would spend the next 40 months in Japan's notorious prisoner war camps where Raider Bob Meter starved to death. This is actually a message that the raiders carved into the floorboards of one of their prison cells. And after the war, that floorboard was cut out, and this was used as an exhibit in the war crimes block. And if you're ever up at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and go to the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force there, this floorboard is on display there. It's a very powerful exhibit to go and see. Now, the Doolittle Raid eradicated in Japan all the opposition to Yamamoto's plan to take Midway. If American aircraft carriers could strike Tokyo, then the flat tops were still a threat and needed to be destroyed. However, the June 1942 Battle of Midway turned out to be a total disaster for the Japanese. But it was the Chinese who really suffered the worst. In an effort to prevent the United States from ever using coastal airfields, as well as to punish those locals who'd helped Doolittle and his men, the Japanese launched a three-month retaliatory campaign that led to an estimated 250,000 deaths. Troops cut the ears and noses off of villagers, set others on fire, and drowned entire families in wells. Japanese not only used incendiary squads to systematically torch more than two dozen cities, towns, and villages, but also unleashed bacteriological warfare in the form of plague, anthrax, cholera, and typhoid. In fact, there's still people living in China today who suffer the, the effects of anthrax. Uh, there's a museum there dedicated to the, uh, the victims of the bacteriological warfare. Now, the United States didn't have any boots on the ground in this part of China uh, to realize exactly what all had gone on until much, much later. In fact, the first American intelligence officer wouldn't reach this part of China until October. Um, but in the course of my research, I discovered that there were a lot of American missionaries in this part of China, and their records were on file at DePaul University up in Chicago. Um, and these records actually were extraordinary in that they included not only letters and diaries and photographs, but even property insurance reports like damage claims that they filed for the destruction of the 31 parishes in the wake of all of this. Now these are actually photographs from DePaul and what you see is as the Japanese, it was a lot like Sherman through the south, as the Japanese were sort of marching from and destroying along their way, the missionaries would flee out into the woods. You can see they're running across a, a stream here and they would build these temporary shelters in the woods and they would wait out the Japanese and they would come back in immediately thereafter. They would see the damage and they would write letters of what was happening, send it by messenger farther down the road to alert other missionaries to get out of the way of the, of the Japanese. Um, those letters really provide a, an up close and personal view of the horror that happened there. In his letter to his bishop, Father Wendelin Dunker described the bloodshed he found. Quote, they killed anybody and everybody for no reason at all. Every town they enter is another Nanking on a small scale. You can see the ruins here of Yingtang. Uh, it's literally nothing but the facades that are, that are standing. Father Vincent Smith echoed him, and he said, quote, I cannot tell you the full story of the brutalities inflicted on these helpless people, on men, women, and children, even upon babies, he wrote. No civilized mind can conceive the tortures which were inflicted on all. At the war's end, the four surviving raiders were released from prison all weighing less than 100 pounds. Chase Nielsen would later return to Japan, uh, to China, as a star witness in the war crimes trial. Here, the executioner of the other three raiders, Sotajira Tatsuda, bows to Nielsen during those proceedings. Four of the men who played a role in the trial and imprisonment and subsequent execution of the raiders were ultimately convicted and sentenced to between five and nine years in prison. The Japanese general who signed the, uh, the actual death order for him had become too valuable of a post-war intelligence asset for the United States. And so um, MacArthur's uh, chief of intelligence at the time sort of stonewalled American war crimes investigators and literally ran out the clock, if you will. Then they had him secretly taken out of Sugamo prison, and, uh, and he went on to serve in the Japanese parliament before he died in a car wreck in the, in the 1960s. Now, Doolittle <clears throat> had promised his men on board the Hornet that when the mission was over, he was going to throw them all a party at his expense. And with the war finally over and the last of his raiders now home from prison, Doolittle prepared to deliver. And the party that he threw in December 1945 for the Raiders started a tradition that carried on more than seven decades, literally all the way up until this year in April. Uh, with the exception of 
two years, once during Vietnam, once during Korea, Korea the Raiders would get together every year, um, and they would toast the Raiders who died on the mission and the Raiders who had subsequently passed away afterwards. In 1959, the city of Tucson presented them with a 80 gold, uh, silver goblets, each inscribed with, um, uh, engraved with each Raider's name, right side up and upside down, so that when the Raider passed away, the goblet could be turned over and you could still read his name. Dick Cole, who's the last surviving Raider, built a mahogany carrying case for them all, lined with velvet, that is uh, what they used to carry them around in. Uh, and so each year they had this tradition where they would all get together. Jimmy Doolittle contributed a bottle of 1896 cognac to it, and the idea being that the last two surviving Raiders would get together, they would open that bottle, the cognac, which was, the significance was it was the year Doolittle was born, and they would toast the other 80 Raiders. Well, a few years back, only four of the Raiders were still alive, and they, uh, one of them was it couldn't travel. And the other three were all in their 90s, and they were worried that they wouldn't be able to travel across country. One of them lived in Montana, one lived in Texas, that they wouldn't be able to all get together. So they went ahead and had that tradition at the, uh, uh, at the Air Force Museum and, uh, and, and opened up that bottle of 1896 cognac. Now, um, I, uh, afterwards, I had the, uh, the privilege of hanging out with Dick Cole, and I asked him, I said, you know, this bottle of cognac's from 1896. Like, you know, that's... 16 years before the Titanic sank. Like, what did it taste like? And uh, he said, you know, he said it's, uh, it was really smooth, actually. He said, you know, uh, he said, you know, the problem with it, I said, yes. He said, they were chintzy with how much they gave me. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, the Raiders, even though that was billed as the big final toast, they still, for the next few years, met. And, uh, and then finally this past year, um, Dave Thatcher was the uh, second to last Raider, and uh, he, was, he was on the flight with Ted Lawson, uh, and Dave Thatcher passed away. And so in April of this year at the Air Force Museum, a small conference room there up above the, uh, the hangars there where they have all the, uh, the displays, um, Dick Cole's the last Raider went in there to have that ceremony and turn over the last goblet. And Dave Thatcher's son, Jeff, is a, is a good friend of mine. And so Jeff invited me as, to go along with his family to attend that ceremony. Uh, and it was incredibly powerful to get to go in to this, you know, this tradition that had now been going on for, for over seven decades. And that morning, it was just, it was Dick and his family and Jeff's family and a few others. And um, Dick, they, they, he had a glass of the cognac from the Doolittle bottle. And he held it up. And they did a roll call of all 79 other Raiders. And after every single name was read, Dick said, here, here, here. And then at the end, he drank that cognac. And it was just an incredibly powerful experience to see that and to see that brotherhood and that fellowship that had continued on. Um, now, the Raiders, in 1947, you know, as they were sort of settling into this tradition of parties each year, they returned back to Miami to have uh, another blast at the same hotel they had been at before, and they had such a good time that the night watchman left this memo for um, his boss the next day. And it's really worth actually just reading a few lines of it here because it says, uh, quote, the do little boys added some gray hairs to my head. This has been the worst night since I worked here. <laughs> they were completely out of my control. So the next day, the Raiders come down, they see this, this memo, and as you can see here, these guys, they just confess right up, let's autograph it, you know, sign it all, a couple dozen of them sign it. And this memo is actually preserved in the Air Force archives down in Montgomery, Alabama, in Maxwell Air Force Base as part of the Doolittle Raider folklore. So, Now that, that concludes my formal presentation, so I'm happy to uh, take any questions from anybody who's got them. So. this thing on? Oh, it is on. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have some time for uh, questions and answers. Uh, as you heard me say at the very beginning of, uh, of the talk tonight, uh, remember, we got a big crowd, so if you can raise your hand, we'll come to you. Wait until you're able to speak into the microphone, so we make sure we pick up your voice on the recording. Uh, also, uh, at least to start off with, please limit yourself to one question. Please make it a question, uh, and then uh, we can come back to you with any second questions if we, uh, if we get all the questions out of the way before we're done. So, is there anybody we can start off with? Right here in front. Who came up with the phrase, toujours au danger? <laughs> <laughs> 
That I'm not sure. So you've thrown me on that one. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, you've thrown me on that. Yeah. Yep. yeah. We, have, we have one on the other side there. That last session that you described with uh, the, the reading uh, of all the names, was that recorded at all? Is there a record yes, of the, that? Uh, the Air Force actually recorded that. And, uh, and I, I'm not sure if they're going to put it online or if they did it for, uh, you know, just for their archives or not. But they did have a film crew there in the back. So very, very powerful experience. All right, we have one right over here. Um, I, I was pretty moved by the fact that more than 200,000 Chinese people lost their lives as a result of this. Um, at, in that time period or afterwards, did anybody reflect on such retaliatory action and the consequences of it? it did it affect military policy or anything like that? Yeah, you know, that's a, uh, the, the retaliation in China has been a, a story that I think has come to attention much more recently. And it's getting much more attention these days than it has in years past. And, uh, and part of it was, you know, they're just, as I noted earlier, there, there was nobody there on the ground to really record it. Um, but more and more people are starting to study it. In fact, there was a uh, Melinda Liu, whose father was actually one of the Chinese locals who helped the Doolittle Raiders in their escape. Um, she's been Newsweek's bureau chief in Beijing, and she's been working on a documentary um, about the Chinese atrocities, and she's been going around and interviewing these victims and whatnot. And I saw at the Air Force Museum earlier this year, uh, she screened a, a rough cut of it, if you will. And it's an incredibly powerful film that will be released hopefully later this year that really examines that. Now, you know, that what happened in the wake of the Doolittle Raid was sort of part of a pattern that you saw, and it happened in Asia. It happened in Nanking in 1937. It happened in Manila in 1945. Uh, and, and the U.S. was not, I mean, we were not unaware of this possibility that this thing may happen. Uh, you know, Nanking was well publicized, the, the, the brutality that happened there. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't one of those things that came out after the war. I mean, it was covered during its time. And the U.S. knew that. I don't think anyone in the U.S. government anticipated it would be a retaliation on the scale and the size that it was. Um, but there's no doubt that knowing that it was going, that there was going to be some sort of retaliation. That's why we kept it a secret from the Chinese. In fact, we didn't tell Chiang Kai-shek until literally right before the operation that was going to happen. When he objected, we said, you know, look, tough. Carriers are already inbound. Um, it's happening. So, uh, but I don't think anybody had any sense of just how violent it would ultimately be. Uh, that's, that's what's come out subsequent to that. So. Mm -hmm. All right, we have another question uh, up here in front. Uh, did they ever consider the B-26, or maybe that hadn't been fielded yet? They did. Yeah, they looked at a range of different planes. I, and I forget why the B-26 was ruled out. Because um, that had a... a, a, a Airman told me a story that uh, with a short uh, wingspan, a lot of the flyers used to call it the flying prostitute. Yeah. <laughs> no visible means of support. Yeah, and you know, they ruled... They ruled out a number of planes for different reasons, whether it was, you know, they, uh, the wingspan wouldn't work or the capabilities for them to be able to take off, like it needed more space than they would be able to have. But they looked at, I think, like uh, it was three or four different airplanes. So, Any other questions? Oh, we got one right over here. Do you find a lot of parallels between Jimmy Doolittle and Eddie Rickenbacker's life? Um, you know, I'll be honest, I didn't really look at, at Rickenbacker's life. I mean, I, I spent most of my time going through really looking at Jimmy Doolittle's life. I think um, one of the things I, I will tell you when looking at Doolittle and that you sadly don't find enough of in, when you're doing these kinds of projects is that he was a pack rat and that he kept copies of so many of the records that he had that not only are the, his mission files are at the Library of Congress, but he kept all the speeches he wrote, his correspondence with his family during the, uh, during the war and whatnot. So, you know, honestly, I spent, it was enough for me just to be able to try and go through really and examine Doolittle's life to be able to put him in the proper context of this operation, so. We have one right over here. Mr. Scott, it appears that you not only were blessed with time with the family and all the friends of the Doolittle Raiders, but you did a lot of research. Yes. In your research, what was the most fascinating aspect of all the research as you discovered? You know, 
It's, it, that's a tough thing because, I mean, each, any project like this has, you, you have big areas that you have to zoom in on as you're kind of working your way through. You have to look at the raid. You have to look at the commanders, the personalities. You have to look at the repercussions, the Japanese, um, the China angle. Um, so it really, you know, figuring out which element of the research was the most appealing is tough to say. One thing I will say is I, I think you hit on a nail on the head. The time I got to spend with a few surviving raiders who were still alive and their families for me was really the highlight. I mean, I count a number of them as really close friends now. Um, you know, I've gone and stayed in their houses and whatnot. I mean, just, you know, in the tradition that these guys, in the legacy that they left, in the way it's now carrying on, because, like, even, the, you know, they had the Doolittle Raiders Association uh, for years. That's now fading away. Now there's the children of the Doolittle Raiders and their, you know, their mission. They get together every year. How can we preserve this in schools and things like that? It's just really a... Uh, it's a wonderful legacy. So I, I would say, you know, I think out of all the research, that's been one of the highlights. Is, I mean, I love getting together with the families. I love getting to spend time with them all. So, yep. During that research in Japan, did you find any information about losses on the part of Japanese air defense forces? In other words, any, any indication that any Japanese aircraft were shot down uh, by the yeah. Raiders? No, we, did, we didn't shoot down any of them. And uh, that, I, that I was able to find any records of. Now, we shot at a few, but, you know, so much of Japan's, you know, their frontline defense was not, was not in Japan at that time. I mean, they were deployed elsewhere. And so a lot, of the, a lot of the Raiders actually said that the Japanese pilots that came up didn't want to engage. And so they really kind of got through a lot easier than I think they anticipated. Now, you have to remember, this is also the first combat mission for these guys. So they really didn't have a lot to judge, judge it by at that time. So, uh, you know, at the time, it seemed, I think, a lot more harrowing than it was. But afterwards, years later, a lot of them said, you yeah, know, we... What I went through later, it was, we actually got off a lot. It was a lot smoother, a lot easier than than, than it could have been. So, uh, yes, can you uh, tell us a little bit about uh, Doolittle's, Doolittle's contributions in his career after the raid? Yeah, uh, I mean, like I said, Doolittle was just really one of the most fascinating characters. He, uh, you know, he went on over to North Africa, where he's commander over North Africa. Then he came back to the Pacific. Um, Doolittle also, you know. One of the things that doesn't get a lot of attention was his his work at Shell Oil. You know, he had gone to work as a, in their in their um, aviation division there, and he recognized that at the time, you know, this was actually between World War One and World War Two, that you know, so many different planes they didn't have any sort of everyone used different types of fuel, different octanes or whatnot, and that you had to be able for the planes that the Air Force wanted to be able to build, you had to have more powerful fuel that could support them all. And so, uh, and he really came up with this idea that we're going to have to come up with 100 octane fuel. And that, you know, if you're going to get these big four engine planes off the ground, you're going to have to be able to do that. And the challenge he had is he had to tell Shell, all right, there's no market for this right now. But I think this is the way aviation is going to go, and you're going to need to build this fuel. If you do that, if you agree to do that, I will then go to the Army and I will sell this to them and get them to buy this kind of fuel, if you will, and, 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 and build your market that way. And a lot of people thought Doolittle was going to fail, and they called it Doolittle's Folly. Uh, but in the end, it was wildly successful. And, yet, and that's, I mean, that's just one example. I mean, Doolittle was constantly, he was a tanker, he was a mechanic, he was an engineer. Uh, you know, another one of my favorites, he was, you know, he was a stunt pilot and a, and, a, and a test pilot. And, you know, he was down actually in the early aviation, early era of aviation, when airplane companies were trying to get off the ground, you know, it's very expensive and whatnot to be able to do that. And they, you know, they would they would come to the Air Force and they would say, "Can we borrow Jimmy Doolittle to help us go overseas to sell our planes?" And the Army recognized that in order to be able to build a domestic aviation industry, they would have to essentially loan Doolittle and other pilots out to be able to do that. And so Doolittle then it goes off and he's sent down on this tour of South America for Curtis. Aviation, where he's got to go and help them. He's got to basically fly their planes and help sell them to Chile and Argentina and places like that. Well, one night at a uh, at a cocktail party, Doolittle goes out and he's you know he's of course you know he's a boxer, he's a gymnast, he's all these kinds of things. So he's had a couple pisco sours and and uh, one of the some of the Chilean guys say, you know what? Are all you Americans like Errol Flynn? Can you guys all do handstands and are acrobats? And Doolittle's like he rose to the challenge, said, of course, and he jumps up on his hands. And, uh, and so they said, no, well, you know, Errol Flynn does it like on window seals and things like that. And so Doolittle then popped up on his hands out on a balcony, sort of on the edge of a window. And of course, the window seal collapsed. And Doolittle fell about 15, 20 feet, and he broke both of his ankles. And so he's put in a hospital. And, uh, and he was mortified by this. And so, um, because he couldn't fly at this point. And he's like, you know, the Army's trusted me. 
they loaned me out to, to Curtis to be able to do this. Here I am, I was an idiot, and I fell, and I broke both my legs, and, and so, but, he, but like so much that Doolittle had done in his life, he said, rather than sulk on that, I want to do something about it. And so he literally had one of his, uh, one of the air crew guys help fashion him some special cast that would hold his legs in place, and they could buckle his feet to the pedals of the plane. They literally carried him out, put him in the cockpit of a plane, and he still went out and flew those planes with broken legs to be able to show that. And what's amazing is like, you know, the, the, in his personnel file are the, the cables from the attache at the embassy back to Washington I mean, describing all this. I mean, this, it sounds like something you would tell at a cocktail party afterwards. Like, yeah, did that really happen? But like, you can go and you can read those. He's like, and then we carried Doolittle out and put him in the plane, you know? <laughs> and it's like, they carried him back out. And so, uh, well, he did that. And when he came back, he actually, uh, he had to have his legs uh, be broken to, in order to heal them correctly. And he almost, in, in this point, he, he, he made the decision wisely that he was going to, you know what, he was at Walter Reed, and his whole career was now on the line. And he said, you know, at this point, I'm actually going to stay, and I'm going to rest up. And he did. And so he stayed in bed, and he healed and whatnot, because literally they were contemplating whether or not he was going to be physically able to continue as, a, as, an, as an Army aviator. So, I mean, that's just, I mean, literally, Doolittle's one of those characters where, you know, this, it's not this raid gets all the attention because it's named after him, but he really did so much from his early era of aviation to shell oil to, uh, you know, to commanding troops in North Africa. I mean, but it's just this raid is one thing that's amazing to latch on to. Uh, the, uh, the prisoner thing, why, why didn't they just wipe out everybody? What was the idea of saving five or whatever the number yeah, was? That's, that's a good question. He asked, you know, why, 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 why just those three? Because all, all eight were originally condemned. And that's a great question. And the, the reality is we don't know. Uh, because the Japanese, the, the military was furious about this. And they wanted to execute all eight of them. And the person who actually came to the defense of these raiders was actually Hideki Tojo. A very unlikely person to use, war minister and prime minister and whatnot. But he he and he didn't do it for any altruistic purpose. He went to the emperor and he said, you know, the United States has all of our consular officials and, and families and whatnot, and they've interned them. And if we kill all eight of them, they could retaliate. And so, but it, but the emperor sort of but but that went against what some of the other military leaders wanted. You know, they wanted sort of an eye for an eye, if you will. And so, they kind of came up with the Solomon's compromise which is we'll execute three and we'll put the other five in prison. And those five that were put in prison were not prisoners of war. They were going to be there for the rest of their lives. They weren't subject to Red Cross um, parcels or any kind of exchange program. They were there to be prisoners. Uh, why they picked those three, we don't know. And we have the, in, uh, the interrogation reports of the Raiders after the attack, but those are all bogus propaganda pieces in which they quote Billy Ferris saying, you know, I just wanted to kill a bunch of Japanese kids and hit hospitals. I mean, they're not true. The actual documentation, what these guys said when they were interrogated, that we don't have. All we have is the stuff that they kept for, that was clearly being used for sort of domestic propaganda purposes. We could surmise that two of them were pilots. You know, uh, Dean Hallmark and Billy Farrell were both pilots. Um, Harold Spatz was a gunner. Why they chose to, sh to kill him, we, we simply don't know. So. Do you have any information on the criteria that Doolittle used to choose his volunteers? Um, pretty much guts was it. I mean, they, uh, you know, do, they, they brought these guys into Columbia, South Carolina, and they told them, look, there's a really dangerous mission. Um, we need volunteers. We can't tell you about it. You're going to be gone for several months, but we can't tell you really anything more about that. Who wants to volunteer? And, you know, they, they, Doolittle had challenges. If you look back in his notes and things like that, I mean, none of the gunners had ever fired a gun in combat. You know, none of them had ever fired a plane in the air. I mean, they were using ground ranges when they were, te when they were trying these things. I mean, when they got these guys down to, uh, down to the panhandle of Florida, I mean, they were, they were doing their overwater navigation. They were doing all this kind of stuff, and, and he was really worried about that. Now, he felt like the pilots and the co-pilots and the navigators were in pretty good shape because they'd been flying and whatnot, but the gunners and stuff, he said, you know, we really don't know, but at the end of the day, we're hoping this isn't a mission that's going to come down to whether or not these guys can shoot those guns. You know, we're hoping they can kind of get in and get out. The other criteria was whether or not they could take off. And, you know, they went over, they had to do their tests of whether or not they could get off in the, in the amount of distance required. And they brought in Hank Miller, who was a Navy pilot, to do it. And Hank Miller, fortunately, was a pack rat like Doolittle, and kept all of his notes 
on every single one of the Raiders. He created this like handwritten spreadsheet, if you will, in which he, he literally, you know, they did it, they tested each plane empty, they tested it with a light load, medium load, and then a full load. And he, he went through and, you know, uh, a few of them washed out for not being able to do that. One of the plane, one, one of them crashed a plane during the, uh, uh, during the tests and whatnot. So um, that was really the big determining factor. Now they trained more crews than just those that went on the mission because they had to have backup crews in case something happened, somebody got sick, you know, appendicitis, something happened in the plane. But every one of those who trained got on, the, got on the Hornet. They didn't want anybody roaming around that had been through that training. So they trained, I think, 24 crews, but uh, only the 16 actually flew it. 